So now let's open it up for questions. And I'll the camera at the outside. <laughs> so, so now any questions from here? Uh, from the people online? I have a question. Am I audible? Yeah, you can hear you quite loud. <laughs> okay. uh, nice talk, by the way. And uh, my first question is uh, the Landau Zener effect. Do you, is there any excitonic effect taken into account? Yeah, I'm laughing because this is exactly what the referees <laughs> said. So yeah, so in the stonks and dice uh, I kind of skipped. But uh, yeah, the stonks and dice had a huge amount of uh, oh, a big exciton. Uh, so you see, uh, this is the LDA gap. Uh, the real gap is about 2 EV. And then you have a uh, an exciton about 1 EV uh, binding energy below that. So in TDDFT, it's, it's, it's very difficult to include exitons, uh, especially uh, when your pulse is uh, kind of nonlinear uh, excitation. Um, so we don't include the exitonic effects there. Um, I don't know for sure if, or I don't think anybody knows how uh, exitons behave under these lambda Zeno excitations. Um, but in any case, you know, we're, we're interested in just exciting from the valence to the conduction. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, the exciton's not going to matter, uh, especially for this, because, you know, we're tuning the frequency here to be the fundamental gap, not the exciton gap. But for Lando Zeno, I, I don't know. I don't know how the, how the uh, exitons will affect things. This is one of the, as I said, this, this is uh, one of the, the things we're working on is, is how to do exciton dynamics in real time uh, with TDDFT. But, uh, you know, some progress the last year or so uh, in linear response exciton dynamics, but, you know, our pulses are too strong. So uh, the, the method they come up with is, is unstable at first, at least. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Maybe um, one question I had, like a, not a question, but more like a general thing, because like many people in matter and extreme conditions run PDFT calculations or DFT calculations, mm -hmm. just to get an idea of the calculations you do. So what is like, roughly speaking, right, your length scales and time scales and how much compute resources do you need to <laughs> actually run these calculations? How much do they differ across these? Just to get an idea. Yeah. So, I mean, they are fairly expensive computationally. Uh, so we, we try to do things as, as small as possible. Um, so for the tungsten diselenide, uh, I mean, we, we use the monolayer because it, it has this quite interesting band structure. Um, but it means, you know, we, we basically have three atoms in a unit cell, but then we have a ton of vacuum, uh, which, which slow does, slow down, slows down the calculation. For the Heuslers, you know, we just use the unit cell, primitive unit cell. So, I mean, generally speaking, we try to keep, let's say, less than 10 atoms. Uh, for runs, and then we run for about the most we've run for is about 100 femtoseconds. I mean, I think there was one calculation there that had 200, but I mean, the problem with running that long is that you know the, the phonons are going to kick in and it, it's probably just not going to be accurate if you if you run for that long. And how long do they take in wall time? Uh, or what kind of resources do you use? Well, so, so we. Um, I have an account on, um, uh, what's it called? This ULIC uh, supercomputer. Uh, and Sangeeta has time on this uh, HLRN. Uh, and there we use, let's say I use four nodes of, depending, they, they sell it as, 
they have 96, I think, uh, processors. It's, it's double that. And, you know, I take four of them for a day or so, and that's one calculation. Um, Do you get to like 120 seconds in a day, roughly, with that setup? No. No, not that far. Um, so like tens of femtoseconds. Yeah, tens of femtoseconds. Yeah, I mean, for bulk, so at the moment I'm running things like bulk, uh, bulk uh, transition metals. Yeah, these, these get about, what, 200 atomic units in, a, mm -hmm. in 12 hours? Okay. <laughs> oh, no, not 200, uh, 2,000. Oh, I'll have to look this up. It's either 200 right. time steps or 200 yeah. uh, atomic units. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's what, five femtoseconds? Yeah, but maybe only five femtoseconds in, a, in 12 hours. hours. Okay. Can we slow? I mean, the, the code we're using, uh, it's, it's this all electron code uh, with these uh, APW uh, plus local orbitals. Does make it a bit slower than, than pseudo potential codes, or probably a lot slower than pseudo potential codes. Mm -hmm. But then, I don't know, for magnetism, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've seen calculations of magnetism. Uh, and there, you know, you have to use these special pseudo potentials that are the semi core states. And really, you know, in order to do the strong collinear magnetization, I think you probably need the all electron codes, or at least you have to be very careful if you don't use them. But yeah, it does cost us a lot of time. Maybe uh, regarding the lambda or senior transition, just as a follow up to Kushan, mm -hmm. so just understanding the physics of it. So you had these transitions and is it, what I understood is it's the uh, oh. kinetic energy. Is that, is it, so does it help because the electrons have enough kinetic energy in this transition uh, it, it, or is it something else? I don't, I, uh, no, I don't think it's kinetic energy, but it is, it is sort of analogous to that, but it, it is the speed in which they're kind of moving through the uh, through the band, or moving in the band uh, that that that, that uh, causes it. I mean, I think Lambda-Zener transitions in molecules. So, if you're in molecular dynamics, you also see them. I think that you have these Bonapartite surfaces, and there there is the kinetic energy of the, the nuclei moving uh, that that that. Uh, Tell you if you hop or not, but here I don't know. It's 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 more it's an analogy to it. I I don't. Uh, so, so it's not known. I I thought maybe it's it's clear. I don't think that I don't think it's the kinetic energy uh, that, that that that's causing it. Or is it tunneling in that sense? It is tunneling. Yeah, you, so you, it's you can, a tunneling problem. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's a tunneling probability. So I mean, in the strong laser physics, you know, you, you have these different pictures in, in solids. So you can have this picture of, of moving within the bands, uh, this intraband motion. But equally, uh, you can look at the, the system in terms of uh, kind of this one area uh, or stark uh, kind of way of thinking of things, where you you know imagine you have a big electric field in the dipole approximation, which is just a big a big uh, like line like this, and then you imagine all your levels getting stacked like this, and then you can tunnel from here to here. So it, it, it's it's it, you can think of it either in this tunneling kind of uh, way of thinking, or you can think of it in this, this intraband motion way of thinking. Okay. It's, it's the same yeah. phenomena, but you're just looking at it in, in different ways. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's really a tunneling. And also, it's, it's a nonlinear thing, you know. I mean, in terms of, you can also think of it as a, as a multi photon process that I'm not, you know, you're still exciting vertically. You're still exciting vertically, but now you're you're doing many many photons uh, to go up. So it's it, it's it's a really a big nonlinear thing. But it, it's just way it's just different ways of thinking about uh, the, the, the same physics. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Let's. Give it some time if people have more questions online. Sure.
I have a f many other things, but I don't want to ask all of them. <laughs> <laughs> One, uh, let's see, let's move to one more question. Sure. It's the phonons. Yeah. I mean, you had on your list yeah. the phonons in ultra fast demagnetization, for yeah. example. Or in general, I'm curious about this because we have this project ongoing where I mean, you're involved in it, Hossein, and a little bit, and Kushal, yeah. and Sandeep, where we look at this with the classical brand. Spin lattice dynamics, and I'm curious. I mean, what do you? Yeah, what ideas do you have here with the so coupling to phonons? Yeah, what we did here is a little bit of. Well, it's not a cheat, but it's a. It, it, it's it's a very limited look at the, the phonon right? effect of the phonons. So, in the code, uh, K implemented this thing where you. And you allow for small, so you know, so I should say in our basic set, we use these LABWs, we have these muffin tins. It's a, a big mess if you want to move these muffin tins uh, 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 with the atoms. Uh, so, what he did instead was he just sort of restricted to a small amplitude motion. So, he keeps this muffin tin fixed, but he moves the nuclear potential in this muffin tin. And so, the, the, if, if, if your oscillations are too wild, uh, yeah, yeah, totally, it goes nuts. It, it, it's very unstable. Um, but as long as your amplitudes are kind of small. So, what we did here is uh, we uh, I calculated the phonon spectra. Uh, I pick out phonons at the very edge of the Brillouin zone or sort of on the middle of, of the uh, Brillouin zone. Uh, and I made supercells of maybe like four four primitive cells together. And then I find the phonons in the in there's only four, there's only four. Uh, well, it depends how many atoms you have in the cell, but uh, uh, and then these phonons, I include the motion of them. Um, so you have to imagine that at some point in the past somebody has excited these phonons uh, coherently, like it's coherent motion. Uh, and then you come in with your laser and look at how that affects things. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, for the demonetization, uh, it made a big difference. Uh, some of these phonon models, I mean, we also chose a system, I think it was, I think it was like iron platinum, iron palladium, and there was one particular phonon that had huge coupling to the electrons. And if we accept that, or if we have that phonon going in our system, you see a big change in, in the in the spin dynamics. Um, but it's not, I mean, what we would like to do, right, is, is you know, you'd like to do a big giant unit cell and have all your atoms moving and have the forces calculated as you go along. This is, uh, this, this was too hard, for, too, too difficult computationally. Uh, so I calculate the phonons in advance and I have predetermined trajectories of the phonons. So we're not using the, 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 the forces. To move the nuclei, the, the, the trajectories of the nuclei is predetermined. Okay. okay. Um, that's also what I mean by coherent. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Then the question is so, right, I mean, basically, in this scheme that we use, it's this uh, uh, what's it called Gilbert Landau Lischitz or uh, uh, equation that is more or less, that's basically one of the equations that is being that is implemented there for the spin dynamics and then that, that equation couples to let's say the equation of motion for the ions oh, okay. and i'm curious i'm asking this this is something probably you should yeah discuss later but would is there maybe a way to if you can do it at least in this limited way these phonon mm -hmm. calculations whether we could somehow Compare or not just compare, but somehow get insight into parameters of of these classical equations of motion. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to look at this London London Lipschitz Gilbert and, and the coupling you have phonons. I, I don't know it myself. I mean, here we're really limited to which phonons we study. So probably, you know, if you think of you're heating up the system, you're going to occupy the 
the low energy phonons first. Whereas the phonons that we're looking at here are usually the ones at the edge of the, the, the band, at the edge of the running zone, and these are normally the high energy ones. Also, we look at the optical phonons as well, which. But you couldn't pick the different the ones. Yeah, but I'd, I'd have to make a huge supercell to, to do the uh, to do the low energy or the, or the low um, wave vector uh, phonons. So maybe for some special uh, setups, we could uh, compare. But I think in general, yeah, we're, 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 this this is going to be quite limited. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you should. Yeah, I'm curious. No, I, I, I mean, it is something we wanted to, 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 to yeah, it is something I wanted to discuss. So. Yeah. Okay. Is there any final chance for questions? I think not. I think there's no, no final question then. Then let's thank Peter again. Thanks, Peter, for. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me. <laughs> and yeah, Peter will be around today and also tomorrow. So, and I think, yeah, Peter is upstairs in the visitor's room. And uh, I think we will talk about also about one question I didn't ask is electrical conductivities. Mm -hmm. And I think we wanted to look at those. So, and I think Kushal will be here tomorrow and he's also curious. Well, yeah. Talk about that. Dielectric functions. Yeah, so the electrical. A, I mean, just to finish, that, that, that's a, a spin hole conductivity. <laughs> um, oh, so okay. I, yeah. also, I also okay. do uh, calculate cool. conductivities, but I mean, mainly interested in the spin hole effect, uh, but yeah, uh, in general, for these. Uh, well, yeah, we should look at this then. Yeah. Outside of this talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us. Bye.